if you have a Bible, either a printed copy like I have or you have a digital copy on your phone or your iPad or something like that, let me encourage you to hold it up and repeat after me what we believe about this book. This is God's Word. It is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. It has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. It is the supreme source of truth for what we believe and how we live. Now, and open up your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter 11, verse 14. That's where we're going to launch this morning as we continue our series. Revelation chapter 11, verse 14. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe in dragons? Do you believe that dragons are real? Well, if you say no, I want you to know that you can go to Riverbank Zoo today and you can see some real dragons, Komodo dragons. They're actual dragons. They can get up to 10 feet in length. They can weigh as much as 300 pounds. They have 60 razor sharp teeth that when they bite their prey, those teeth inject venom into their prey. Komodo dragons are apex predators. What that means is that they dominate whatever ecosystem that they live in. Now those dragons are the real deal. Even though they don't breathe fire, even though they can't fly, they're real dragons. But this morning as we look at the passage that we're going to dive into, particularly when we get to chapter 12, we're going to see some unusual things. And one of the unusual things that we are going to see is a dragon. And that dragon is the most dangerous dragon that has ever been brought to planet earth. But the good news is, God's word already tells us about the defeat of that dragon. Now as we get into the verses that we're going to look at today, we are at the beginning of the end. What that means is the, the battle that has been fought in our universe since time as we know it is about to come to an end. Now at this point, we are at the midpoint of something that we call the tribulation. Three and a half years have passed and three and a half years are yet to come in the tribulation. The church has been raptured. The church has been taken up into heaven. And the world has entered into a time where God's wrath is being poured out on the world. The world has already experienced the seal judgments. And the world has already experienced six of the trumpet judgments. The seventh trumpet is about to be blown and when that trumpet is blown, it will unleash the final judgments of God, the seven bowl judgments. So I want you to follow along as, as I read, beginning in verse 14. It says, then the second terror is past. But look, the third terror is coming quickly. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices shouting in heaven. The world has now become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. The 24 elders sitting on their thrones before God fell with their faces to the ground and worshipped him. And they said, we give thanks to you, Lord God, the Almighty, the one who is and who always was. For now, you have assumed your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were filled with wrath, but now the time of your wrath has come. It is time to judge the dead and reward your servants, the prophets, as well as your holy people and all who fear your name, from the least to the greatest. It is time to destroy all who have caused destruction on the earth. Then in heaven, the temple of God was opened and the ark of his covenant could be seen inside the temple. Lightning flashed, thunder crashed and roared. There was an earthquake and a terrible hailstorm. 
Then as you look at verse 14, you discover that the third terror or the third woe, depending on which translation you have, is about to come. That word terror or woe refers to distress, grief, extreme suffering. These three woes coincide with the final three trumpet judgments of God. The first terror began in in chapter 9, verse 1, when these locust-like demons were unleashed upon the earth, and they tormented mankind for five months. Mankind was so tormented that, that man wanted to die, but they were not allowed to die. The second terror occurred when when an army of demonic angels killed one-third of the people who were on planet earth. But now the seventh trumpet is blown, and the third terror is about to begin, and it signals the beginning of the end. As we read these verses at the end of chapter 11, it's as if God is giving us a sneak peek of his grand finale. God is giving us the conclusion. God is giving us the climax before he gives us the rest of the details of the story. Now, notice what it says in verse 15. It says, the world has now become the kingdom of our Lord. Remember that one of the things that Jesus told us that we are to pray is your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in Heaven, we are told as followers of Jesus that as we pray the way Jesus taught us to pray, one of the things we pray is, God, we pray that your kingdom will come. And as we get to this point in the book of Revelation, we are seeing what we have prayed for, what we have longed for, what we have been looking forward to is about to happen. You see, God's kingdom is about to come to earth. Now let me remind you, the Bible teaches us that Satan is the ruler of this world today. But right here in this chapter, we see that things are about to change. We are told that there is joy in heaven when this happens. But on earth there is judgment, only the wrath of God for those who have rejected God, those who have rebelled against his word. Those who have rebelled against his rule in their life. And so as we look at these first verses, there are two things that I want you to remember. First of all, you and I should be praying daily for God's kingdom to come on earth. Understand, this world is not our home. Don't get comfortable here. God didn't intend for you to live in this sin-filled world. God has something far better for you. And the problem happens when we get so comfortable in this world that we want the Lord to tarry for a little while longer. Our prayer should always be, God, bring your kingdom to earth as your kingdom is reigning in heaven. But there's a second thing you need to see in these first verses, and that is the end has already been written And God wins, amen? You see, some people have this idea that there's this cosmic battle being fought between two equals and Satan and God are battling and and one day we're going to discover who the winner is. No, uh uh-uh. God's the winner. It's already in the book. Dear brothers and sisters, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are on the winning team. But as we move to chapter 12, we begin to see some unusual things. And the first thing we see is two wonders in heaven. Listen to what it says in in verse 6 and following. Then I witnessed in heaven an event of great significance. I saw a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon beneath her feet, and, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant. And she cried out because of her labor pains and the agony of giving birth. Then I witnessed in heaven another significant event. I saw a large red dragon with seven heads and ten horns with seven crowns on his head. His tail swept away one-third of the stars in heaven and he threw them to the earth. He stood in front of the woman as she was about to give birth, ready to devour her baby as soon as it was born. 
she gave birth to a son who was to rule all nations with an iron rod. And her child was snatched away from the dragon, was called up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness where God had prepared a place to care for her for 1260 days, three and a half years. Now this chapter begins with some unusual things. I mean, if you read chapter 12 and you go, this isn't unusual, this isn't strange, this isn't weird, then something's probably wrong with you. I mean, I read this and I go, what is this talking about? Now, John begins by seeing two events. If you're reading from the New Living Translation, in verse 1 and verse 3, there are two events. If you're reading from the King James Version, it talks about two wonders. The word that is translated there literally means sign. And a sign that is used here, the Greek word for sign, is a representation that points to something else. A sign isn't literal. A sign is something figurative that is pointing to something literal. And the first sign, the first wonder, the first event that John sees is a woman. And she's clothed with the sun, and she has the moon beneath her feet, and she has a crown with 12 stars on her head. And and who is that? I mean, if that represents someone, who does that represent? Well, there are some Catholics believe that this woman represents Mary, the mother of Jesus. But that can't be because the mother of Jesus did not go through what this woman went through. There are other people that say, well, this woman represents The church, but that can't be because the church didn't give birth to Jesus. Jesus gave birth to the church. Mary Baker Eddy, who was the founder of Christian Science, said this woman was her. Well, she is crazy. (laughs) And you need to understand there are a lot of crazy people that teach crazy things out there. And, And so who was this woman? Well, if you go to the Old Testament and you begin to study, it becomes clear that this woman is a representative of the nation of Israel. In Genesis chapter 37, Joseph is having these dreams. Remember, Joseph was a dreamer, and he had one dream, and then he had a second dream. In the second dream, he had a dream that the sun, the moon, and, and 11 stars were bowing down before him. And the sun was Jacob, Israel, his father. The moon was Rachel, his mother, and the 11 stars were his 11 brothers. You had one star to that, Joseph, and you have the 12 sons of Jacob, the 12 sons of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. You see, this woman that we see here is a picture of the nation of Israel. When you study the Old Testament, you will discover that that oftentimes in the Old Testament, uh, Israel is referred to as a woman, sometimes in a good sense, other times in a not so good sense. There are either, even times in the Old Testament where Israel is referred to as a woman who is about to give birth. And this woman is about to give birth. Now hold on to that. Now the next sign, the next wonder that we see is this large red dragon. And who is this large red dragon? Well, we don't have to wonder about that. Because in verse 9 we are told this large red dragon is none other than Satan himself. That serpent that was in the garden of old this serpent or dragon is the devil and we're told that he has seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns and and we're told that again in chapter 13 and so we're going to wait to look at that next week when we look at all that that means but then we are told that his tail the dragon's tail satan's tail sweeps away one-third of the stars in heaven now what does that mean Well, that is referring back to two passages of Scripture in the Old Testament, in Isaiah and in Ezekiel, where Satan rebels against God. Satan wants to sit on the throne of God. He wants to take over heaven. But that's just foolish. I mean, who can take over heaven? Who can fight against the Creator? And remember, God is the one who created all the angels. These angels aren't equal to God. They are created by God. But Satan was such a powerful angel, and he was such a convincing angel, that he convinced one-third of the angels in heaven to rebel with him against God's authority. 
So this one-third of these stars, these angels, are representative of these angels that fell with Satan when they rebelled against God. We now refer to them as demons or fallen angels. And they are seeking to subvert mankind, to manipulate world events, to stir up chaos in our world, and to ultimately bring the destruction of all humanity. You need to understand, Satan and his army, that's his desire. His desire is to kill, steal, and destroy. And the Bible tells us that that Satan and his angels have an immense amount of freedom today. They've been given that freedom by God. And we're told in this passage that this dragon wants to devour the child that this woman is about to give birth to. And then we're introduced to the third character in in these verses, and that is this child that is born. And who is this child? Well, as we read, we discover that this child is none other than Jesus, who was given to the world as a gift to the nation of Israel. You see, Jesus is of the tribe of David. He came from the line of David, and he is the the Messiah of the Jews, the, the nation of Israel, but he is the Savior of the world. And so Jesus is a gift given to the world through the nation Israel. And Satan knew that Jesus was going to be coming. I mean, even in the very first book of the Bible, we are told this. When, when the serpent of old, Satan, calls Adam and Eve to sin against God, we are told that the seed of woman will crush the head of the serpent. And so the dragon, Satan, began to do everything he could to stop that from happening. He knew that it had already been prophesied. The seed of woman will curse my or stomp on, crush my head. And so he began to do everything he could to stop it by trying to wipe out the nation of Israel, by trying to remove the line of David. When Jesus was finally born, he convinced Herod to to kill all the baby boys that were born in Judea, hoping to kill Jesus, but Jesus escaped. When Jesus became an adult, the crowds of Nazareth tried to throw him off of a cliff, but Jesus walked right through them. And then later on, Satan devised this plot, this plan, where he got the religious leaders of the Jewish nation and the Roman authorities to go together and nail Jesus to a cross. And when Jesus breathed his last breath on that cross and his tomb was sealed, Satan thought that he had finally won. He had finally stopped this prophecy that was revealed at the very beginning of time. But little did he know that what he meant for evil, God was going to use for good. And the death of Jesus and the subsequent resurrection of Jesus are the only things that have provided salvation for you and me. And so understand, this is that child that we read about here. Now, it says here that in verse 5 that it tells us about three significant events referring to Jesus. It talks about his birth. The woman gave birth talks about his ascension to heaven after his death. He was called up with God to his throne. And it talks about his return. It says he will rule with an iron rod. David prophesied this about the Messiah in Psalm chapter 2. In verse 9 it says you will break them with an iron rod. John wrote about this in Revelation chapter 19. He tells us that when Jesus returns, from his mouth will come a sharp sword to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with an iron rod. And so this child that was born is clearly Jesus. Now notice verse 6. The woman Israel will flee to the wilderness, but she will be protected by God for three and a half years, the first or the, the final half of the tribulation. The first three and a half years of the tribulation, if you remember the book of Daniel when we were going through it, the Antichrist um, signs this treaty with the nation of Israel, and they build a temple, they begin to worship again in that temple, but at the midpoint of the tribulation, the Antichrist breaks that treaty and sets himself up as God in the temple of God in Jerusalem. And so that's when this is happening. 
When that's happening, the Jews do not bow down to the Antichrist. They will not worship him. And Satan turns on the Jewish people and tries to kill them, tries to remove them from planet Earth. But God protects them supernaturally, miraculously, for the final three and a half years of the tribulation. Jesus talked about this in Matthew 24. He said, the day is coming when you will see what Daniel the prophet spoke about, the sacrilegious object that causes desecration standing in the holy place. Reader, pay attention. Then those in Judea must flee to the hills. A person out on the deck on a roof must not go down into the house to pack. A person out in the field must not return even to get a coat. How terrible it will be for pregnant women and for nursing mothers in those days. And pray that your flight will not be in winter or on the Sabbath. He's talking about that time when the Jews are having to leave Jerusalem and the surrounding areas fleeing from that destruction that is coming at the hands of Satan. And so we see these two great wonders that take place in heaven revealing God's plan for Israel in the last days. How the dragon, Satan, is a part of that. And how Jesus will deliver the people ultimately and ultimately. But then we see a war that takes place in heaven. Notice what it says in verse 7. It says, then there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. And the dragon lost the battle. And he and his angels were forced out of heaven. The great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, was thrown down to the earth with all his angels. Then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens, it has come at last, salvation and power in the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth, the one who accuses them before our God day and night, and they have defeated him by the blood of the Lamb and their testimony, and they did not love their lives so much as they were afraid to die. Then in these verses, we're told about this war in heaven, and we're told that Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels, but Michael and his angels defeated those angels, and he cast them out of heaven. Now, the question we have to ask is, when did this happen? This battle that we read about, when did this battle take place? Has it already taken place? Or is it something that is to take place in the future? Well, when we read Scripture, and we read the context of this passage, and we allow Scripture to interpret Scripture, it becomes obvious that this battle in heaven takes place at the midpoint of the tribulation. Now, I know that's a struggle for some of us because we think that Satan is in hell today. But Satan isn't in hell today. You see, people think that Satan has his throne in hell and he's ruling from hell. Let me tell you, Satan doesn't want to go to hell. Satan hadn't been to hell. And he's doing everything he can to keep from being in hell. Hell is his ultimate destination, but he's not there yet. And when he gets there, he's not going to rule hell. He's going to be a prisoner in hell, just like everyone who has rejected Jesus and rebelled against his right to rule their lives. And so where is Satan today? He's been cast out of heaven. Where is he today? Well, the Bible says two things. One, he is a roaring lion, roaming the earth, looking whom he may devour. So Satan is all over the world, roaming, looking for people to destroy. And he has an army of demons, fallen angels, who are looking for people to destroy. But you need to understand something else that the Bible teaches. Today, Satan has access to heaven. Satan can enter heaven. You, you say, how is that? Well, do you remember the book of Job? Do you remember the first two chapters? When the angels came before the throne of God and one of those angels was Satan and God said, have you seen my servant Job? And Satan said, you let me get a hold of Job and he won't be the servant you think he is. Do you remember that? He was accusing Job before the throne of God. In the book of Zechariah chapter 3, we see Satan accusing 
the high priest of God. And in this passage right here, it says that Satan is accusing the brethren before the throne night and day. Understand, Satan today has access to heaven. And when you sin, let me tell you, he's in heaven telling God everything you did. He's going to tell God what you did as soon as you've done it. Because he wants to fill you with guilt. And he's telling God, you see what they did? You see how they acted? Did you hear what they said? They say they love you. They don't love you. They don't know you. They deserve to burn in hell. Not me. But you know the good news? The Bible says in 1 John 2 that we have an advocate in heaven who pleads our case before the Father. And that advocate is Jesus. And so whenever Satan enters into the throne room telling God about all the things you did wrong, if you're a child of God, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've been born again through the blood of Jesus, Jesus is before the throne pleading your case. And he is saying, yep, They messed up again, but you know what? I've saved them. I've redeemed them. They've been changed. They've been bought by the blood of the Lamb. They belong to me. So understand today, Satan has that access to the throne, but there is coming a day, I believe it's at the midpoint of the tribulation, where Satan is going to literally be kicked out of heaven. And when that happens, there is going to be rejoicing, the Bible says, in heaven, but there's going to be terror on earth. And notice what it says here. They are rejoicing because they overcame the dragon. And how do they do that? By the blood of the lamb and the power of their testimonies. The blood of the lamb. Oh, what can wash away your sins? Oh, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash away your sins? Oh, let me hear you. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, there's power, there's power. There's wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. Oh, there's only one source of victory for those of us who want to go to heaven, and that's through the blood of Jesus. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there could be no forgiveness of sin. I love what that old song says, would you be free from the burden of sin? Well, there's power in the blood. There's power in the blood Oh, listen to me. The only way you and I can be saved is have the blood of Jesus wash our sins away. The blood of Jesus has to be put to our account to pay for our sins. And the only way that's going to happen is if you repent of your sins, you place your faith in Jesus, you surrender your life to him, and his blood, his blood covers your sins permanently. But he says that we overcome the dragon by the blood of the lamb and the power of our testimony. Our testimony is simply the outward act of telling others what Jesus has done for us. And I want you to know that sharing our testimony is a powerful tool in overcoming the enemy of this world, overcoming Satan. Let me encourage you, if you want to grow and become strong in the faith, share your testimony. If you want to have victory over the power of sin in your life, if there are strongholds of sin in your life and you want to have victory over those, don't wait to share your testimony. Begin to share your testimony. And then it says they love their lives. They love not their lives. Every believer should have that attitude, an attitude of surrender that says, my life is not my own. My life belongs to Jesus. Oh, let me tell you, when Satan is kicked out of heaven once and for all, for good, there's rejoicing in heaven. But notice what it says. There is terror on earth because the devil is down on the earth. And he is filled with fury because he knows that his time is limited That takes me to the final truth we see in this chapter, and that is a warning to the people of earth. Notice what it says in verse 12. It says, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who live in the heavens, rejoice. But terror will come on the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you in great anger, knowing that he has only a little time. When the dragon realized that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child, but she was given two wings like those of a great eagle so she could fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness. 
There she would be cared for and protected from the dragon for a time, times, and half of a time, three and a half years. Then the dragon tried to drown the woman with a flood of water that flowed from his mouth, but the earth helped her by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that gushed out from the mouth of the dragon. And the dragon was angry at the woman and declared war against the rest of her children, all who keep God's commands and maintain their testimony for Jesus. When Satan is cast out of heaven, he realizes the die is cast. My time is limited. And he makes one final assault on God's people, the Jews. You see, Satan has always hated the Jews. The Jews are God's chosen people. And even though we are in a season, a time in history where the Jewish people have rejected their Messiah, they are still God's chosen people. And God still has a plan for Israel that will be fulfilled during these last days. And so during these last days, when Satan is kicked out of heaven, he brings his full fury against the Jews. But God is supernaturally protecting them for these last three and a half years of the tribulation. That phrase, eagle's wings, is often used in the Old Testament to describe God's protection. In Exodus 19, verse 4, when God is delivering the Jews from bondage in Egypt, it says that, that he brought them out on the wings of eagles. In Isaiah, we are told that when the people came out of captivity in Babylon and were returning to Jerusalem, that he brought them out on the wings of eagles. And so this is simply telling us that God is taking them to a place of his protection and his safety. But then Satan is going to bring a flood to try to destroy them. Now, what does that mean? Is that a literal flood or is that a figurative flood? I believe that it is a figurative flood. But understand, the flood tide of Satan's anger cannot get through the dam of God's protection. Amen? Satan can do anything he wants to and everything he wants to. But when God is determined to protect us, nothing can get through to us. So what does Satan do? Well, the scripture says he takes his fury out on the rest of her children. Those who are not Jews who have given their heart and life to Jesus. And so the very last part of this tribulation, there is going to be an onslaught on everyone who gets saved during this period of time. Will people get saved? Yes. We've discovered already that there's going to be a great revival that takes place during this tribulation period. But that's not a reason for you to wait. That's not a reason for you to live your life and say, well, if I'm still here when Jesus comes and takes the church, I'll give my life to him then. Chances are you won't. It's so important if we know that we need Jesus to give our heart and life to him now. So I'm here to tell you, if you're here, God's Holy Spirit is drawing you to himself that's God telling you that you need Jesus. That's God telling you that you need to be saved. And so I would ask you today, have you repented of your sin? Turned from sin, saying, God, I don't want to live that way anymore. Have you trusted Jesus alone to save you by what he did on the cross? Have you surrendered your life to him as your Lord Asking him to fill you with his spirit. If you haven't, it doesn't matter what you've done. You're not saved. And if you have, then I can guarantee you on the authority of God's word that God's spirit is living in you right now. And you've been born again. And if you're here and you're questioning whether you're born again or not, then I would say chances are you're not. Because if God's spirit is living in you, the Bible says his spirit will testify with your spirit that you are a child of God. And so have you been saved? Oh, brothers and sisters, the end is coming. Soon and very soon, Jesus is coming for his church, his bride. And those who know him will be taken out of this world. And we will enter into the darkest period this world has ever known. And you're not going to want to be here. So you need to get ready. 
Are you ready? I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. With your head bowed and with your eyes closed, if you're here and you don't know that you're ready to meet God, you don't know that Jesus is your Savior and Lord, you don't know that you've been born again and made new, then I encourage you today to humble yourself before God and ask Him to save you by praying this prayer. Dear God, I come to you today acknowledging that I am a sinner. I've lived life my way. I've lived as if I were on the throne. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross to pay for my sins. Jesus, I believe you rose from the grave, defeating sin and death for me. Today, I'm turning from my sin. Today, I'm trusting you to save me. Come into my life, take control. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing my prayer. Thank you for saving me.